Hello, hello, hello. How's everyone doing? Excellent. Still high spirits, that's what I'm talking about. The coffee is strong here. Fantastic. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're in our home stretch. Uh, we have some exciting talks to close it out here. Uh, we're going to be starting with the CTO of Leap Motion, David Holes. He has some very cool stuff to share with us, and he has a lot of equipment, which should get every VR enthusiast in the house very, very excited. I'm going to hand it off to David. Let's give him a round of applause. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, I can barely see anything, but uh, hopefully I'll get to tell you guys a few things that are interesting. So uh, my name's David, and uh, I'm one of the founders of a company called Leap Motion. Uh, we do a lot of, we do, we, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we do in a second, but uh, we're basically at a really interesting place where uh, we're one of the uh, key sensor companies in this space right now. And so a lot of people talk to us, and people tend not to talk to each other. And that, that puts us in a situation where we can actually kind of maybe actually see what's going to happen. And uh, people don't usually talk about it because it's sort of everybody's so competitive with each other. But we think it's really important to kind of uh, try to wrap everything together and give people some, uh, some sense of where things are going and what's going to happen. And I'm not trying to like spill the beans and everybody's products, but uh, it's really more of uh, general trends and uh, and sort of uh, the pace of things uh, that, we, that we probably can expect. Uh, and uh, so uh, before I talk about the future, I want to talk uh, a little bit, I want to give a quick disclaimer, which is that uh, if I was to tell everybody exactly what was going to happen, I would probably sound completely crazy. So if I'm going to have any likelihood of being correct about anything, I'm going to have to sound a little bit crazy, you know, which is basically kind of a paraphrase of an Arthur C. Clarke thing. And, you know, uh, I th think it's pretty true. Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk a little bit about sensors, I'm going to talk a little about displays, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing today at Leap Motion and what you can do now. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to try to break things into sort of three discrete generations. It's sort of unusual, but it kind of helps uh, focus things down. Uh, so we've got sort of our generation one uh, head mounted displays, just like this, you know, a desktop and, uh, you know, a uh, head mount display, some cables, a webcam. It's a, you know, maybe a, maybe a wheel, maybe some wands, uh, a lot of different things. And you tend, to, you tend to know that it's sort of one of these generation ones, as I would call it, by the, the fact that there's, you know, there's a lot of tethered cables, there's big form factor, there's multi-devices, there's multiple devices. There's not really anything that you can hold in your sand, hands and say, this is a VR product, because it's really everything together that kind of creates this VR experience. Uh, there's a lot of really pros to this, which is that, like, you know, it's available, any computing device can be one of these things, but we're very much limited by sort of smartphone era technology, uh, 2010 era like device input output conventions and uh, like relatively old optics. The good news is that this stuff can be really cheap and it's about now, but it's, we think it's going to, uh, most of this presentation is not going to be about what you guys are familiar with, hopefully. And uh, uh, anyway, so the sensors that exist right now, you know, we basically, we have our wheels, joysticks, keyboards, mice. Uh, and we're starting to get these sort of uh, 3D handhold controllers, like the Moves, the Hydras, the Vive controllers. Um, and uh, really, so we mostly have old stuff. We have some new stuff that's getting refined, and then we have a lot of sort of more out there stuff, like Kinect and our stuff, and the head trackers, and the PlayStation Eye computer vision. And that stuff is just going under, is, is really rapid, rapid, rapidly evolving right now. Um, and, you know, again, everything's available with this first generation, but it's all very much off-the-shelf parts and every, you know, the bandwidth, the cost, the power, the size, everything isn't where it should be. Um, so I want to just talk about what we do really, really quick before, uh, in case somebody has no idea who I am, I guess, or, or what we do. Uh, so we make this thing on the side called the Leap Motion Controller. It's this uh, uh, aluminum thing. And basically, it's uh, two cameras in a box, and you can get a mount for it, and you can put it on a head mount display. And basically, the cameras see across a cone that's bigger than the field of view of the VR headset. And then basically, what that lets you do is sort of like it gives you hands in virtual reality and lets you do very fine physical interactions. Uh, so I'm going to take a brief second and do my only demos of the talk just to give you guys a quick uh, look at those things. Oh, cool. This is. Um, uh, Okay, so you can basically see um, I have one of the headsets here. I've got two cameras. I've got like a camera here and a camera here. And then if I put my hands on top, you basically see a skeletal 
3D hand overlaid on top of that. So this is, we're mostly a software company, though we make hardware too, and a lot of our software is about sort of uh, taking, taking hands like this and tracking them in the presence of occlusion, uh, doing stuff like, uh, like, how should I say, like, like this, so you can't see the fingers, we still kind of have to report them out, and, think, and basically powering physical interaction like this. And uh, so I want to show a quick example of maybe what that can be used for. And uh, on stage demos are always a little bit intense, but let's give it a go. Uh, so you see in the demo that I was just showing, we have these sort of skeletal hands. And uh, in a lot of these newer ones, we actually take the camera images and we pass them through and we make those your hands. Uh, so I'm gonna speak a little loudly here and I'm gonna get further away. Can everyone still hear me? Okay. So I'm gonna put the headset on now. If I'm about to walk up the stage, someone warn me. Uh, so I've got my hands and you can see my hands come in. I've got these little blue things. It basically says the hands being tracked, everything's good. And uh, now I have some kind of keying gesture. So I basically I put the fingers together and we have sort of, you know, there's a pinch and it's being seen. I'm gonna put two hands in, and now I'm gonna, you see I have some kind of two, uh, you okay? Okay. Uh, we got some kind of two, two hand gesture, and now I'm basically creating a, a block, and now I've got this block in front of me in space. Wow, that actually happened so fast. <laughs> uh, so, and basically with the tracking, I can kind of paint the hand behind the surface, so this is sort of a behind surface thing. And, uh, and then of course I'm gonna reach out and grab this second, but before I do that, I kinda wanna say that uh, because there's no block here, if I just use a physics engine, my hand will basically go through the object. And if it goes through the object and the physics engine trying to do its best, it's probably gonna slide out of my hands. So we actually, in order to make this work, we have to build a whole nother engine. Not the physics engine, not a game engine, but something between the two that we call the interaction engine. So I'm gonna grab this uh, block right here. And I can see that actually the fingers are inside of the block a little bit, but it's okay because I can still power physical interaction like this. I'm gonna drop this down and so, you know, so basically I can now do this very, very fine physical type of stuff. And basically uh, this is one of this is this is sort of very cutting edge. This is sort of one of our internal things right now. But this starts to cross what I would call the uncanny valley of VR interaction. Whereas it right now it doesn't actually look like to you guys that I'm using a computer or that I'm using some piece of technology. It looks like I'm just interacting with some physical objects. And that's Kind of a big deal, actually. That's a that's a really big deal. And uh, so I'm going to do wait one more thing. Let's see if I can. Up, up. And that's really hard. Uh, I can't. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything crazier than that. But uh, yeah. So that's what we do. We think that you know if virtual reality is going to be like actual reality, it makes sense to have your hands. And uh, we think over time that's going to become more and more uh, fundamental to what we sort of see as, as, as uh, see in this entire space. Uh, so uh, that gives you some sense of, and, and basically, so okay, that's a perf this, so this uh, sensor is a PC peripheral. You can buy them now. You can buy a mount. You can put it on there now. There's APIs. You can do pretty much all this stuff. The interaction engine is not public yet, but that's stuff that we're working on making public soon. And it's a lot of motivation for what we're working on, like what do we think should be a, like, like the sort of defining experience of this interface, and we think it should be stuff like that. Uh, but this is all stuff that's either already available or imminently available. So that's kind of the present. Uh, and uh, so uh, now, now we might be asking, like, what did, what do we, so like, what, what did you actually see, and what do things actually need to be like in order to create these, you know, very, very physical experiences in VR? Uh, well, basically, you need a field of view that's bigger than the head mounted display because if you see your hands, you should be able to track your hands. You need high frame rates, ideally much more than the head mounted display. Uh, you need the, skel the skeletal tracking is what allows you to interact with objects even when you don't see the fingers. And you need really, really low latency. Uh, so right now, this peripheral basically gives you 120 frames a second, 8 millisecond latency on the video, 4 millisecond latency on the hand tracking, 140 degrees by 120 degree field of view. And it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, and so that's, that's what we have now. And uh, where do things go in the near future? Uh, here's another sensor we've been working on. Uh, some people, like the, Oculus has like the Crystal Cove. We have, this is a Dragonfly prototype, where each sensor is, instead of being like low resolution, it's like a 3K color sensor uh, with, red, with, with, uh, red, with red, green, blue, and infrared pixels. So you can see a little pattern down there, red, green, red, green, red, green, blue, infrared, blue, infrared, blue, infrared. 
So basically the infrared tracks the hands, the color gives you visible imagery through the headset, and it makes it look like you're looking through a piece of glass instead of sort of a, uh, you know, um, a tube like you would be maybe with a, looking through a, a webcam type of thing. And uh, so this has much higher speed, much higher resolution, bigger field of view, and this is an example of something that we might be able to see very soon as the hardware becomes sort of more custom made for VR. Uh, so now we've kind of got this generation one hand display with the stuff that you've seen, and I think that it's, it's kind of, to, to, before I go to generation two, I kind of wanted to show them the contrast. So we have this desktop, we have these cables, and then all of a sudden we have this. And it's kind of incredible for a second just to say like, where did the computer go? Like, you know, it's like the headset is the same size, but there's no computer and there's no cables and no external stuff. That's actually, I think that's a big enough deal that I kind of differentiate that as an entirely different generation. And uh, there are some sacrifices, you know, this, the, we, we're using phone processors now, we're, we're, you know, there's uh, none of the external sensing, but it is a very different game all of a sudden. Uh, you know, uh, it, it goes from something that I really can't carry on with me to something that I could use on the train or on a plane or that I could actually take to somebody's house uh, casually. And so that just, it fundamentally changes the sort of the product. That's, it's like the product identity itself is different. Uh, and uh, so we usually say these generation two ones are sort of untethered. They're still big, but they're single device products. And that's, I think, the most important thing. And uh, they're portable, they'll be available because they use lots of, they use cell phones right now, but they are very much limited by cell phones. Cell phones have a, a lot of problems and uh, I think what we'll see to sort of, we'll see a lot of little hacks to improve them. Like uh, right here you see there's like a little battery pack in that person's pocket with like an iPod cable. Something like that gives you like six hours of battery life instead of two. But at the end of the day, whether or not, uh, whether or not we're able to improve phones for VR experiences uh, will basically determine sort of the destiny of this type of device. Um, but, uh, and, and so here's an example. We have a phone, we have a headset, we have some sensor, we have some battery. Uh, so that's what something like that might look like. We don't use the phone camera because it's very small in comparison to the field of view of a VR headset. So ideally you have some stereoscopic wide field of view cameras. That's our Dragonfly prototype. I think it's, it's good to take a second to say how does input change when you go to these more mobile products? Well all of a sudden like the idea of having a wheel or a joystick which is awesome if you're in your like uh, gamer den. It doesn't really make sense if you want to like use it on the train. You know, if you bring a wheel on the train you probably seem pretty crazy. Uh, so, uh, likewise, same with the keyboard, not going to have a keyboard in your face, they're not going to have anything to mouse on, uh, and, you know, any of these holdable controllers have to become really small, really wireless, maybe even wearable, because you don't want to have, like, Wiimote holsters, you know, as you walk around somebody's house. Uh, and uh, I think that's, it's really good and really important to sort of think about that for a second, because it's a huge departure from what people are currently thinking a lot, a lot publicly in terms of, like, the practicality of physical interfaces that we are, are that we're looking at a lot right now. Uh, um, but anyway, so you can't, so this is like an example of tough to take that on an airplane, um, but it's cool. And uh, so as this is happening, these touchless sensors are basically expanding in breadth and scope. So, you know, we're going to have cameras tracking the eyes and hands and bodies and heads and objects and your mouth and the environment and voice recognition and like uh, it's, all of it's going to come together to like this. The, the, crazy fusion of input modalities which basically allows totally new types of computing that are vastly more capable than before. Uh, the limitation is going to be on the software side because how do we, it, making stuff for new input is hard and then if you have six new input devices all coming together at the same time it's going to be, you know, really hard. Uh, but it's, stuff, it's, it's basically the, uh, the future of computing. It's basically all this multimodal stuff together. Uh, I say mouth tracking and some people think that sounds weird, but uh, we're starting to see it now. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show a picture, to the, the, there was a co-published Oculus paper recently that shows some of that. And if you think about it, uh, if you want avatars in a game, you might want to like smile and stuff, you know, if you're doing some kind of social VR. And, uh, and if you have mouth tracking and you fuse that with voice recognition, that's also super powerful. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so as we're sort of losing these physical interfaces, you might ask, okay, where do I put them? Like, where do I put the interfaces? I want to, you know, uh, do I have like floating menus everywhere? Do I have, and then do I have a floating menu in this game that's this for or this game? And it gets very confusing. But the trend we're seeing is what I'll call sort of virtual wearable interfaces. So what you do is you start to put the interface on people's hands. So you see here's a guy and he's sort of tilting his hand towards the camera and these sort of interface elements come out. And, uh, and here now he's going to, let's hopefully it'll load up okay. Uh, he's basically picking, there we go. He's looking at the interface, he's picking a bunch of things, he's changing a bunch of stuff really fast. And there is no interface in the environment, the interface is sort of worn on the hands. And there are a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, of course this is super powerful and super cool. 
Uh, here's another one where I have sort of this holographic arm HUD. That so I you know I kind of have like I look at my arm and I see like the time and I flip my arm over and menus come out and I can start to manipulate the world around me through this sort of virtual wearable interface. The idea is that the interface gets carried around with you through different spaces and you can make that very consistent uh, in a ways that you can't really make floating menus consistent. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. So where do things go beyond this? As I said, the smartphone stuff is probably in slight danger. Uh, because it's a question of whether the market is so commoditized that we can, that basically, um, we ha it has this initial advantage of portability, mobility, but uh, the problem is, is that you really want to start throwing lots of technology in there. And you can put things in the smartphone case, but you can't put things in the phone because all of a sudden you want to put something that costs $5 in a phone that ships 100 million every year and it becomes, you know, uh, burdensome on the general phone population. So what you're going to see is this, this departure, which I'll call generation three head mounted displays, which, uh, they're usually untethered, they're small, they're, they're usually untethered, and then the big difference is that you'll see that they're, they have custom displays, custom optics, custom sensors, they're single device products, and because of all, all this stuff, all this custom stuff, they're actually small. Uh, they'll be way more portable, they'll be in some sense be fashionable, they'll still be limited by battery tech, but we're gonna see them much sooner than I think a lot of people uh, imagine. So I'm gonna show you a few quick examples. Uh, so I obviously can't show you guys anything that's like secret, I can just show you stuff that's on the internet. And there's stuff, stuff on the internet that, you know, and, and, but any, all my favorite stuff I can't show, so quick disclaimer. Uh, so this is called a fiber optic collimator OLED uh, head mount display. So the idea is you have this sort of little curved fiber optic thing that basically turns a flat screen into a curved screen. And then you can use very simple optics and collapse the whole thing down. So instead of having a big head mounted display, you have a very small head mounted display. And that has about the same specs that we're currently custom to seeing with something big. Uh, and uh, here's another one where basically you have this plastic substrate in front of the eye and you have little OLEDs in there and they basically face outward and then they bounce off a holographic, uh, it's called the holographic optical element, uh, uh, there's a lot of ways I can call it, but basically it bounces it back into your eye and then you have something that looks like this, it's a little colorful but it's transparent and it has a wide field of view and it's basically totally unlike anything we would imagine seeing, probably, maybe people probably say that 10 years but this is stuff that's probably uh, five years. Uh, and so uh, basically this is a fundamental shift in what the product is and that's why I would call it a different generation. Uh, and uh, so you might be wondering I guess, you know, what is, what is sensors, well actually, that, you know, you, you see this, you see this like pair of glasses and you're like, well where do the cameras go? The leap motion sensor looks pretty big or something. But you know, uh, cameras also have to get uh, really small. So here's an example of, a, of a, something called a wafer level camera and there's a pencil and basically you have a little image sensor and you have a wafer of optics and you crunch them all together and you get something really, really tiny like this. And so basically you start basically pushing these things into the frames and it's challenging and interesting uh, and uh, that's what's some of the stuff that's happening right now. So basically you, you realize these sensors are getting tiny and uh, uh, the, the sensors are getting super tiny. They're probably like three by three but they're three millimeters or smaller. Maybe you could fit a one centimeter one but it would be like a Ray-Ban glasses. Uh, you'll have ASICs that do a lot of this motion sensing, like the hand, tr the hand tracking on a tiny chip. And then when you realize I have this three millimeter sensor and I have this, you know, uh, one centimeter chip that can do all that, and then you realize oh, I have something that's only a centimeter big that can track hands, that can track bodies, that can track mouths. And it's a, basically, you, you start realizing you have these sort of ultra smart, ultra tiny sensors that can pipper environments and, you know, start sensing things independent of people's, without having to be worn on people's faces, which is really interesting. So basically, in this, you start seeing not just these smaller sensors, but more ubiquitous sensors. The idea is like a, a, a light bulb can be, you know, we can expect to be much more sophisticated than like a modern day Connect 2. So the idea is if the light sees me, it, it also tracks me and Bluetooth things to, you know, tr skeletal tracking information to things that have permission to have that information. Uh, and uh, so here's an example of sort of, uh, an, of, of uh, what one of these sort of ideal systems might look like. So this is a 10, and this, this, is a, this would be like a pair of glasses, and there's 10 sensors. There's two sensors looking down, there's two sensors looking sideways, since they're looking up, there's three sensors looking forward, and then there's two sensors looking at your eyes. And so there's 10 different sensors. You have a 260 by 220 degree field of view for basically hand tracking, and the downward sensors cover your like mouth and feet. And uh, the three sensors give you sort of high dynamic range finding, which is like uh, 3D mapping at things both very close and very far simultaneously. 
So that's pretty advanced and pretty crazy. And when I first showed this to the people, when I first showed a picture like this to the public like eight or nine months ago, people were like, whoa, that, that's a lot of sensors. And now, you know, we're starting to see some uh, public examples of this, like the new Microsoft HoloLens uh, has seven sensors. And that, you know, I, the, the one I'm talking about here is eight plus two looking at your eyes. So it's starting to look very similar. And this is just sort of the general trends that we're going to see. And then, you know, mouth tracking might sound weird, but here's this thing that just sh showed up a few weeks ago where it's uh, this Oculus co-published mouth tracking thing. And uh, it shouldn't have the camera really far away like that, but you could have it at the bottom looking down, uh, sort of where the nose is, and that would work just as well. Uh, yeah, so at a high level, I want to talk about, you know, the, basically the, the possibility for change is profound and surreal here. Uh, each of these generations that I've been talking about are, are basically going to appear within one year of the other. So, it, so they're all going to overlap, and they're all going to be there at the same time. And you know, this is basically the portability and ubiquity of the mobile era, like meeting the most immersive technologies we can muster as a species. And there's lots of dangers, but there's lots of potential as well. And uh, I guess as I start to talk about this, some people might say, "Wait a second. So David just talked about this. Uh, you know, he has a he has a very short window for the generation one, generation two, but a very long window for the generation three. So I wanted to give like a f little bit more information this time and maybe say, you know, well, what actually happens in this generation three over these, you know, 2017 to 2020. Now I'm getting further out there, so I might st I'm going to start sounding crazier, but it's also going to sound way cooler. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, we're going to go, we're gonna, we, we talked about these transparent displays. So, you know, when you make custom displays, there's no reason why you can't make them transparent. Uh, so the transparency, though, at first is going to be additive only. And so with all these, that means that if I want to project something onto my environment, I can only project light. I can't project darkness. Because how do you project darkness into people's eyes? It's super weird. Uh, so, I mean, basically what you're going to get at first is you're going to get the ability to change the transparency of the entire headset. So maybe I have a, a transparent headset that goes opaque. Or, and then eventually that's going to become more and more localized. So eventually for every pixel, I can basically set an opacity and a luminosity. Uh, which is going to, that's something that happens further out. But the earlier stuff is we start seeing these uniform transparencies. And what that means is that if some, at some point these transparent ones become really good, they also are VR headsets simultaneously. Uh, we're going to start having these selective focuses. Some people call it light fields, where basically right now we have a fixed focus, and then that goes to a variable focus, and then it goes from, you know, we have right now one focal plane. So when everything in a, in a VR headset right now is at the same focal depth, it doesn't matter if it's close or far away. But now people start putting things at different focal depths. So that means that if it's a close object, my eyes will actually have to focus on it, versus if it's a far object. Like when I focus at a close object, far away objects become blurry, which is supposed to be a lot more comfortable. And uh, I, I can kind of vouch that it's more comfortable. It's, uh, it's really interesting. It's hard to really totally understand the, 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 uh, the consequences, the, like the, uh, the sort of what, what comes out of that. But it's uh, a definite focus and trend right now. And, uh, and then as we get sort of further into the, you know, closer to 2020, we're basically going to see this big battle between sort of what I'll call emissive displays and like projective displays. So emissive displays are like LCDs and OLEDs, and these sort of retinal projection displays are like more like a LCOS or like an L, you know, like a, a laser retinal projector, like something really crazy, like you're shooting a laser even in somebody's eye and drawing a picture on the back of the retina, uh, which is all stuff that kind of exists right now, but um, I really couldn't say any, anything about it. Uh, so basically, the, per the, 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 the benefits to going into these projections is that you basically have lower power, uh, much lower power, uh, because you're shooting directly into the eye. Uh, you have shared light sources, so the left eye, what, what, what shoots light into the left eye can also shoot left right into the right eye. And then you can basically put the projectors on the side of the head so, that, so you can reduce the form factor a lot. So that's just a, that, that's probably going to happen pretty fast, but you know, the big battle will probably happen before one wins over the other. Um, yeah. And sensors get really crazy, so we start having like millimeter waves and ultrasonic depth cameras and laser rays and electric fields and you know more and more phased array stuff and you know like uh, they call them stacked image sensors. So you're stacking image sensors on top of each other. You're doing compressive sensing, which is a whole another talk in itself. Like frameless cameras, meaning there's no much such thing as a frame rate anymore. Lensless cameras, which means there's no optics. Uh, and you know there's really really crazy weird technologies that basically are really meant for computer vision and sensing. Which at the at, you know at the moment almost all image sensors are not meant for computer vision. They're meant for taking pictures with your phone. Uh, and uh, so philosophically, what we're look what the sensor guys are going for is like we want these devices that you're wearing to be sort of maximally self-sufficient. So if you're in the desert, you can still create a good experience. But if I'm like in my house. Maybe my house can augment it and reduce the battery consumption and offload compute and you know think, and basically Im improve the experience and reduce the cost of that experience. 
Uh, and uh, so here's like a laser array. Here's a stacked sensor. So here, you know, normally the, the circuits are sort of to the side of the pixels, and so you can't really have a lot of circuitry per pixel. And then when you stack them on top of each other, every pixel can have its own circuit. And it's like a, you can do really, really complicated processing. You could even have like the whole hand processing underneath the sensor. Uh, and, uh, and again, this is a tiny sensor that we showed before, but it has a lens on it. And if you want to go smaller than this, you basically like you can't because lenses suck, I guess. Uh, and so here's a lensed wafer level camera, and here's a lensless camera. And I had a really hard time actually, the marketing photo sucks because I have to zoom in, you can't even really see it, but that's the sensor. It's in like the little O right there. And it's basically just a little piece of silicon with a mask on top and it's computationally forming images, which is crazy and cool. Um, and uh, you can imagine when sensors get this big and when processing gets small, you know, you know, we start getting crazy ideas like smart dust. Like there's a, you know, like little computers that have, that are like a millimeter tall with sensors and that's a whole nother talk. Uh, and uh, so one of the, so basically you're going to see a lot of, I think the, the, the best thing about all this crazy technology coming together and this market becoming real is that basically um, a lot of technologies that don't make sense in phones, like if I had an awesome battery, like if I can make your battery 10 times longer but I made you pay $500, you probably wouldn't pay for it because the market wouldn't pay for it because it's not worth that. Like two days is good enough for a phone. But, uh, but a lot of these battery technologies, a lot of these processor technology, and also processors don't really need to be that much better for phones either, arguably. Uh, and so the idea is a lot of these technologies that are better, it's hard to justify with our current computing. And so a lot of these, all of a sudden you'll be like, well, you can pay more and now you don't have to have a battery or, uh, that you carry around separately. Or you can pay more and all of a sudden you don't need to connect to the internet to render something that's, that's good. And uh, so like, you know, it, uh, basically sort of pay more to have less in some ways. And so, you know, we're going to see all these crazy, like, in this time frame, this is all, a lot of this is public now, like Intel's moving away from silicon and so we're going to seven nanometers and five nanometers, we're using gallium, we're using graphene, we have like metal air batteries which is super weird, we have super capacitors so things can charge fast and that's all really weird. Uh, and uh, so I kind of want to reflect on all this together, I might be throwing a lot of information out there, uh, I, I guess I am throwing a lot of information out there. So let's reflect for maybe a few minutes uh, on sort of what all this means. Uh, so like, uh, basically, oh shoot, my slides reloading. So the first question is sort of like, what is it really, we're talking about a lot of digital stuff and bringing digital stuff into the physical world and it, it's worth asking for a second like, what is that, what does digital even really mean? Like when people say digital, what is that? And uh, I think right now when people say digital they mean sort of like, it doesn't look real, it doesn't act real, it's not a real thing. It's like this whole other separate thing that is not part of my normal experience. And I think over time, it, it, all of these things come together, that, that, that really changes fundamentally. Like the digital medium because of, becomes just a physical material of the everyday world. You have like plastic, wood, metal, and like digital stuff. And you know, kids might just say like, well you know, some things are made of like atoms and waves and some things are made of bits and bytes. It's just like different materials are made of different things. And, and that's a really fundamental like philosoph, like the, 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 how we perceive the world changes at a philosophical level and, and even at a practical level, like these human, like the human senses start to get a little weird. So this is all going to sound increasingly crazy, but it's all very natural. So like people have like real time access to this, like I'm wearing ultrasonic depth sen sensors and infrared cameras that can see like around me. I can like, with infrared I can see like uh, blood vessels under my skin, I can see in the dark. Like every kid has like access to night vision, 3D ultrasonic, you know, goggles. And like, you know, you have environmental sensors everywhere, so all of a sudden, like, if there's sensors in the other room that track me, I can see the other room without even being in the other room, so I can start, like, seeing through walls and through buildings or, you know, everything's mapped and you have, like, local sensors and I can, like, kind of see the city from without even, you know, from above, like, just really crazy weird stuff. And, uh, which is all very natural, of course, as you're wearing these things and all these sensors are so ubiquitous. And, uh, you know, so our kids are going to get really weird. And uh, like they're gonna grow up, and like to us, like what does it mean for something to see something? Like they, I, when I say I see something or hear something, I'm very biased to like the things in the real world. If I see something, it's there. If I hear something, you know, maybe it's over there and it's bouncing off a wall, but it means a very physical, simple thing. But you know, now all of a sudden, like sights don't have to be sights, sound doesn't have to be sound. All these things that can be remapped and interchanged, and kids grow up being able to interchange these senses, and they get really weird, as I said. Uh, reality to them will mean something very different than it means to us. And, uh, but our kids will be cool. 
So, like, basically, the, the, what I would say, the, the human experience is going to get vastly expanded. You know, kids grow up, they don't just play with soccer balls, they play with atoms and galaxies and quantum particles. And just like now, they have an intuition for, if I throw a basketball, it moves like this. They'll be like, if I take a galaxy and move it through this, at this angle and this speed and this mass, then the stars will go like this, and quantum particles bounce off, you know, around things like this, of course. You know, like, who didn't know that? And that's really incredible, actually. And not just sort of intuitions for sort of like physics and the universe, but intuitions for math. So like, you know, as a kid, I would often ask things like, why does gravity behave that way? And you say, well, here's an equation. And it doesn't really give you anything. But all of a sudden now you realize, well, you know, gravity is just a force and you can change the numbers. And there's a whole spectrum of forces that don't even exist in this universe. And basically you realize gravity is just one natural color, like one natural part of that color spectrum of possible forces. And now I have like a fundamental understanding of force which is like goes beyond understanding sort of the universe, but sort of the mathematical stuff that underlies everything. Uh, yeah, and so basically, pro and, and so like we have all this, we have these crazy people and basically how we ch solve problems and how we go from there is completely different. You know, like right now, I would argue a lot of our technological problem solving is done by abstract thinkers. We work with things on the nanometer scale, but we don't, like as humans, we don't interact with things on the nanometer scale. So, but, but all of a sudden now we're basically making the abstract into concrete. So the idea is like physical, intuitive, social, emotional intelligence is actually now able to solve abstract problems. You know, I can, someone like Jane Goodall who could explore the forest now can all of a sudden explore the brain. Whereas like previously, like a thing like that would be sort of limited to somebody who can use a computer, you know, with a, in a very technical programmic way. And, uh, and so, and, and, and of course, so basically the, no, the technical becomes the non-technical and then there's be something called the new technical and I don't even know what that is. So, anyway, you know, there's a saying that's sort of cliche, but any sufficiently techno advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and you basically see we're going towards a really magical place, and uh, I like to end with you saying, won't that be fun? So, I'm going to just take questions for a little while, and I know I'm a little bit fast, but uh, people usually have some questions, and I, and I can do some more demos if anybody wants to see something specific, and uh, yeah, so, <laughs> uh, is there microphones, or... That was very interesting, thank you. Um, are you familiar at all with the author Greg Egan and his book Diaspora? No, I haven't. No. Um, well, the idea is uh, essentially, I actually haven't made it my way through because it it's pretty dense, but it's about uh, a future world where people essentially don't even live in the real world and then it, creating your own reality and understanding physics uh, sort of experientially through these virtual worlds that we inhabit. So. I'm, Kind of curious if that's where you see us going with the sort of the final part of your talk there. Yeah, um, I think what we're going to see is a lot of uh, this is good actually because I didn't get to cover this as much as I wanted to. The, the a lot of merging of physical and non-physical stuff. So like you'll see a lot of blended realities. So like I'll have a table with virtual things on it, or like a digital table. I guess I can't, but I, you know, like a digital table with digital things on it, or maybe like um, I'm on an airplane and I'm watching a movie. And then, but but like somebody's, but like the 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 attendant is coming by with drinks, and so they they like I'm in a movie theater, and then the attendant kind of fades in like mist into my movie theater, and I grab my drink. So like I'm somehow in both realities simultaneously. There'll be a lot of like mixed weird stuff because it's all actually pretty easy to do. Uh, so I think it'll be much more mixed than that. I, I think that it's possible for people to be isolationist, and just like how there are certain people who like just stay in their basements and play World of Warcraft all day, like it's gonna that stuff's not gonna go away but I think that most people will prefer some form of mixed reality. And so I think that's the, where most people are going. Um, first, thanks, that was really cool. Um, second, won't it be fun? I don't want this to just be my kids being really cool. I want that <laughs> to be me too. Um, so I guess my, my questions are kind of like twofold. It's like one, how do we make sure that we're on the right side of this? I feel like if we're here, we're kind of on the right track anyway. Yeah. Uh, but then number two, how do we encourage people outside of like kind of virtual reality and technology in general to be more accepting of these kind of ideas without just being like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, I think you just have to, there's sort of like, you, tr you try to, you try to lock onto the most believable things. So like say like this giant goggles will eventually be like a pair of glasses. And if you get them to say okay to that, they say okay, then people wear them all the time. Okay, sure. But then all of a sudden like they see digital things all the time in physical space. Okay, sure. And then it kind of spirals out of control from there. So you kind of just have to get a foothold and then kind of expand out because it's all very, very natural. It's just that when I start talking about details like lensless cameras and you know, laser arrays, that, that's where you sound a little bit more crazy to a normal person. But I wanted to have some cool stuff for you guys.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, David. Oh, too close. Uh, I really liked your talk. Uh, blew my mind more than once. I have a fairly pedestrian question from uh, maybe the first third of the talk. Uh -huh. uh, you just kind of, uh, you showed, I think, a preview of the dragonfly sensor that leaps uh, yeah. uh -huh. up. Here we go. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, yeah, great. That's exactly the image I was referring to. So uh, you can see the two, uh, the two CMOS sensors there the, mm -hmm. on the chip. Mm -hmm. And given that you're, you're, you seem to be uh, targeting like uh, a pass-through application, I was wondering if, if there's uh, any reason that the actual physical sensors are not uh, adjustable in terms of IPD because I think that's so critical for comfortable pass-throughs, like stereoscopic yeah. pass-through, and it just seems like you have such a terrific product there and that just that t t tiny little yeah, detail yeah, would just yeah, be yeah. killer. Yeah, no, so, you know, this is just a reference design, so no one ever, like, um, we give people, like, our business model is we give them, like, a reference design and then they just do what they want and they license our software. So we, they, we let people change stuff like that. Uh, there's something really, this is actually good, there's a lot of really good topics here. There's some really interesting stuff to pass through. So like, um, the first thing is that if, if you want to have good pass through, it's actually less important to have the right distance between the cameras, and it's more important to actually know the distance between your eyes. Because if I don't know the distance between your eyes, then it's sort of always going to be really wrong. Right, so just to clarify, I meant if the user can configure their IPD and software, then they yeah. can actually uh, have the camera adjust the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the width of the sensor, so it would all be matched together. Yeah, so what you really want is you really want it to automatically figure out your eye, dis your eye distance, and, uh, and then if you know the eye distance, you can actually digitally shift things a bit, and it's actually pretty good. Uh, it's not that you, it's necessarily better to do that than to actually physically move the sensors, but if you just digitally correct, it's actually, it's, it's a, it's really, really good. Uh, there are a lot of general dangers, though. In some ways, actually, uh, and weirdly enough, I prefer it if it's three centimeters, not six centimeters, because if it's really close to my IPD, all the little things that are like not quite right kind of trip you up more and more. You get into this uncanny valley, and so, like for example, uh, I can I can like throw and catch a ball with a three centimeters, but if it's six six point four uh, six, uh, six point uh, four centimeters and my eyes are fifty nine, I actually can't. Because my eye, because my brain goes from like a, like relative mode, which is like my hand's closer, my hand's further, to my hand is two millimeters in the wrong place, and everything just kind of it's really tough. So you almost like that fine adjustment is probably something you want to do digitally, not mechanically, and that, that's why I would say that you know, that, that knowing the distance from the eyes is really important. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, thanks for the speech. Uh, so do you know Nimo VR? Mm -hmm. So uh, Facebook acquired uh, Nimo VR, mm -hmm. and during Nimo VR's Kickstarter campaign, they directly compare the motion with their performance. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, it's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. So take a guess what they are doing right now for Oculus and Facebook, because I asked Robert Shaw, but he refused to tell me what, what they are doing. So you take a guess, please. Uh, I mean, I'm not really going to talk, I really shouldn't talk about specific companies because, you know, I can't say how, what I'm doing with who, but, you know, at a high level, like, uh, we're going to, you know, we, we just want to sort of solve the interface problem, you know, and right now we think that the, the limit in technology is not sort of the size, the cost, or the speed, but how we interact with it, and so we just want to see that problem solved, and if someone like Microsoft or Apple comes out with like an awesome hand tracking technology, it's probably good for us because right now we're the only guys who do hand tracking. And right now, everyone, and, and, and so it like, you almost want, if it's a real market, then there's going to be more people. So I'm okay with that. But that said, hand tracking is really, really hard. And so like, it's really, so like, for example, uh, like Microsoft showed off some hand tracking recently. And it's very easy, actually, to make a demo that shows that it's possible to track hands. But some, a, lot, a lot of these, you have to be careful and like, read the papers. Because like, for example, in the Microsoft one, it looks really good, but they're actually rendering 90,000 hands a second on the graphics card, comparing all of them to the image that they see, and then whichever one matches best, they use that. And so like, and, and, then, and then when the, so like the, the press is really like, this is really awesome looking, and then they ask the researcher, when are we gonna ship this? And the researcher's like, whoa, wait, like maybe five years, I don't know. And so basically, it's, you have to always be really careful, and you know, with any of these things that, that look like it's possible to track hands, uh, because, of course, there's a huge difference between showing that it's possible and, you know, like the rest, there's, we've been working very hard for many years and, you know, I'm happy to see other people in the field, but I just would just emphasize that it's really hard to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. More from over here? Hey. Hey. Uh, so, I just tried the leap motion thing just before we came to talk. It was cool. great. 
And my reaction was, why, yeah. why, would, why would anyone wear a glove? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but something, that, something struck me, and it was around the ergonomics of mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be there was two ways you could do it. Either you, you were, had your hands up like mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. in your face, or you had your head down like this. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at long periods of time, mm -hmm. either of those two are kind of non-optimal. Yeah. You, you've looked at the ergonomics. And yeah, 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 something yeah. As a generation mm -hmm. one and a half, might yeah. be something that comes along. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I really like this concept that I showed earlier, which is uh, there's some cameras looking down okay. and some cameras looking out. And so the idea is my hands can be low or my hands can be high. And so you need to have the camera sort of having that wide field of view. Uh, I think actually what people want is like, we, we do experiment a lot with this. And it's really interesting because like, I think what we, what we are finding is that it's not that people want to have their hands like completely not in their field of vision. What they want to do is they want to look down with their eyeballs and they can't. So right now in virtual reality, you can't look down with your eyeballs. And it's kind of insane just to say that, but like, because it, you know, if you think about it, your eyes are just fixed and all you can do is rotate your head. So there is sort of an inherent problem right there, which is that like I'm used to being able to look down with my eyes to prevent my neck from having to do this, but I, I just, that's just not, an, I hope, I don't actually know how that's gonna be solved, and I'm sure there's a lot of people thinking about that one, but uh, I think that's the real problem. But outside of that, like it is possible to track hands when they're down here or up here. And then what you have to do is if your hands are completely out of your field of vision, you need to create like visual feedback basically to, sh to kind of show what's going on still. And you can do that, but uh, right now, we are finding that when we, even when we do like do that, a lot of people still prefer to see their hands because like, uh, so you know, the answer is, is like, uh, if they want to interact with a physical object, they just sort of want to see everything like, right so much anyway, either looking down or they're looking at it. And the, the second you make it indirect, you lose a lot of the advantages of using hands. Uh, but we have done some indirect things that's kind of cool, but it's super dangerous. Uh, but basically, like, you know, if you have your hands and there's like visual feedback, like rays flying out here and I'm like steering my hands, you know, that way, it's, it's, uh, you can totally do it, but it's, you have to be really careful and it's a whole other set of problem space. So right now we're mostly focused on like situations where you see your hands and you see the objects because we think that's sort of immediately compelling. But we do agree that long term, you do need to be able to somehow either look down or have more visual feedback for really long periods of time so that you can kind of do stuff like that. Uh, Another thing we'll see is like uh, surfaces. So you know, you know, at some point it makes sense to like you'll track the hand. You can rest your hand on a table and you can merge some 3D. Maybe like the 3D objects are in the table, but I'm like kind of resting my hand instead of like I'm resting my hand like on a force field, but it's really like a table. You know, so like there's lots of ways to bring surfaces into it too. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff like that. And in general, I encourage people with hands like quick momentary things are are often much more compelling than. Like quick momentary, like the things I'm doing with the blocks are kind of comfortable because it's just like a normal physical interaction. But things that are not comfortable are like a Superman game where you hold your hands out for like 20 minutes. So, you know, but it's really easy for people to build those experiences. So you kind of always have to be like, please don't. And you kind of have to push away from that. But as long as you. Big shoulders from just. Yeah, yeah. Around. But as long as you build things around like physical interaction, like I interact with physical objects every day. And although, yes, I can tilt my eyes down, like it's not that bad. So I think it's, uh, you know, uh, actually, this is really good too. There's another point, which is that uh, we kind of see hands as this sort of fundamental universal interface, but that doesn't mean that like if you're playing a driving game, you're gonna have hands out on an air wheel, you know, or, or like, you know, if you're using a painting game, you can't have something in your hands on a surface. Like we do think there's gonna be other interfaces and that virtual reality is gonna be, you know, ver as varied as actual reality in terms of tools and, you know, and experiences. But we do see hands as sort of being universal. They're always there. You don't have to carry them around. Uh, they carry themselves, uh, you know, and uh, that really lets you build really sort of really fundamental basic physical interaction that's just really compelling. So that's what we're kind of focusing on now, but totally agree with you every other way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Great talk and amazing demo. Thank you. Uh, do you have any insights into haptic kind of force uh, feedback? Yes, I should put that in here. The evolution of that, how that's yeah. going to happen? Yeah, so thank you very much for asking that, and I need to add slides about that. So the first thing everybody asks is like, can you put a vibration motor on someone's finger? And then we try that and then it just feels like instead of touching an object, your finger's just vibrating sort of, and it doesn't really feel like anything real. And then you realize, I don't really want vibration, I want like force. You know, I want to push on the object, I want to push back against me. And then I want to feel texture. And so like force and texture are probably the most key ingredients of haptics. And both of those are really hard. Like force, I almost hope nobody ever invents it because if somebody can like push force fields around, that's really scary and weird, but that, I don't know when that's ever gonna happen, but texture and sort of soft things, uh, that's already happening. So there's like a company called Ultra Haptics out of the University of Bristol, and they basically have is they have an array of ultrasonic transducers, and they basically shape beamform sound, and they can actually sort of like 
Imagine they focus the sound down, and they send out a pulse, and then it pings, and you can feel it. And then you can actually start to feel textures on your hand. Not like really fine textures, there's a limit, but you can like, uh, they did one demo where like they put a ball in my hand, and I could move my hand around, and I actually felt the ball going around the inside of my hand with momentum. And they kind of, they, they use a leap motion sensor, which is cool, and you know, it kind of all feedbacks into it. You can actually, you get a lot of that. But you don't get hard force. You get like slight texture, you get like, you get like moderately detailed texture, and you get sort of like the amount of force of, uh, I would say like uh, blowing on somebody's hands, like, like that, like, like kind of like, you can get like a kind of bree like a focused breeze, but you don't get like somebody slapping you on the face. And uh, that kind of ultrasonic stuff is really cool. It will become cheaper. You will actually be long range, but it's line of sight. That'll probably be the, be the biggest limitation. So that means if I have it on my face, I can't create force on the back of my hand. Or if I have force things out there, I can't do it on the front of my hand. So you would need like an array of ultrasonic things that steer sound around the room and you could do it. Uh, but you know, it'll come after all the sensors and everything else. Haptics always comes after sensing. Uh, I have one other quick one. Uh, in your timeline, where does uh, Magic Leap fit in? Oh, I can't tell it in either times. But like Magic Leap is super cool, and you know, Google invested in them, and you know, uh, it's it's probably you know, the, the, I hope they're not coming out with a smartphone or something. But you know, uh, so I'm sure I'm sure we're going to see lots of cool stuff. Hi. Um, I'm a, I'm a bit of VR. So I'm just wondering, like a, a lot of this, you're framing your Gen 2 and Gen 3 in terms of wearable stuff that's on your person and particularly on your face and all the sensors are concentrated on your face. And it just seems like, um, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of things you're not able to track with sensors on your face. Any motion that's outside of your, like if I'm waving to somebody, if you're, if you wanna look at what your fingers are doing behind your palm mm -hmm. um, and and I, I feel like I, in some applications, like social VR, et cetera, those, some of those are very important things to track. Mm -hmm. And kind of, uh, do, do you think that there will be some other way to track those in a mm -hmm. way that will fit into these systems? Yeah, so when I, uh, the picture I have right here, you, we've got like 260 by 220, so that's like this to this. So like this is okay, but this is not okay. Um, so at some point, uh, for those sorts of things, you either need to wear a lot of stuff, which is probably burdensome, or you're gonna have environmental sensors. So like an example I like to give is like, you know, maybe I'm in a living room and I have like a Kinect thing on my TV and that like gets like a good HD image of my face through my transparent glasses and also tracks my hands and stuff like, or maybe like the light bulbs in my room also kind of do stuff like that. So I think environmental sensors are actually really important. Uh, I, I think that you won't be able to depend on them. So like it's one of those right. things where like it's like- if you're on the train, yeah. then you might not have any environmental yeah. sensors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you won't be able to Skype with a video of your face if you're on the train, but you could do it with an avatar. So like it'll be like weird limitations like that. It'll be like having Wi-Fi, like it's like you have like your, I don't know, what you, ooh, that's, I have to come up with a new word, like Y sensors. I don't know, like environment sensors, like something, something. There's some word there, uh, and that's those will be. I, I think it's. I think those are going to be really important and really cool, and they're going to add a lot of functionality. But there's going to be a lot of focus on uh, um, putting stuff on the headset itself. Just because any, whenever you can do that, it's like you always have it. I mean, it's intuitive because, yeah, whenever you put it on, you automatically have that. There's no extra steps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's going to be just a lot of focus there. And there's a lot that can be done there. Like, there's no real technology constraints, only market constraints. So mm -hmm. I, I do think that is going to develop as sort of quickly and crazy as, as it can. But the, envir but as I, well, the way I think of what's going to happen is that you're going to have this crazy market forces pushing things onto people's faces. And that'll shrink things down so much that you'll be able to put them in the environment really easily. So I think basically that's what's going to happen. It's going to be four faces, but then it'll right. basically be easy to put it in the environment. Because it has to be so small and yeah, yeah. comfortable. Yeah, and low power and cheap anyway. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, I don't whatever. I'll just put it in my light bulbs, and you know, then it's everywhere. Uh, yeah, eventually maybe down to like little dust size modes. That gets super scary. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I, got, I got another one. Um, I'm curious where you see implantable or like retinal implants uh, uh, falling yeah. because inevitably people don't want to wear things yeah and already we have technology for blind people yeah um, how far do you think that is i think what we'll see first is like a uh, glasses without any glass like something that sticks out of the side of your face very slightly but like it shoots it directly into retina from the side so like something more like something like that i think you'll see something like that way before you see any uh and before you see implants you'll have contact lenses but contact lenses are super hard to do like, like contact lenses are probably like 20, 30 or something. It's like really another decade and implants, I don't know if there's a technology constraint as much as there is just a cultural constraint. Like just the cultural constraint will prevent the technology from being developed. 
you know. Uh, so it's it's one, it probably it probably needs like to the, it probably needs to be sufficiently easy that medicine can do it without cons like consumer technology is way more sort of way more resources than like medical technology for the most part. So like it probably has to be easy enough that medicine can do it, and then medicine will do it to like somebody who's blind, and people will be like, well, you know, I don't like my eyes anyway, and like you know, it'll like one of these weird kids will do that, and then it'll like slowly start to. Maybe like now we're talking about like 2040 or something, so it's gonna be way out there. As it would be cool though, uh, I'm not. I'm, I might be too old for that though. Like I might never. Like that might be my line. Like you know, as an old guy, like no, I'm not gonna take my. I'm not gonna take my eyeballs out. Uh, which is I. I and I, I. You know, so there's like, there's some some kids. I actually heard some some of the kids in VR. They're like more much more open-minded than me. One of them said, "You need to be more biologically flexible." And I'm like, "What?" Like, I, I'm an old guy now. Like that, that made me like, no. Like I don't want to take my eyes out. No, that's just, that's just no. I can't do it. It's it's I, maybe I'm just like a weak person. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, that's 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 my line. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. We've, I've, that's actually so there's, there's a cool leap motion thing. Is you take uh, one of the coolest original leap motion experiences was. But outside of hand tracking was if you have the camera on somebody's head and they're looking through the eyes, if you take it off their head, it feels like somebody grabs your eyes, pulls them off of your head, you're still seeing, you're detaching from your body, and it's just it's the weirdest feeling ever. Uh, so there, lots of weird, yeah, when I talk about weird stuff with all, this all this stuff leads to weird things. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, do we have one more question or, or good? Okay, we're good for the day. Thanks, guys.